All right. Okay. So hello, hello. Um, welcome to Campbell Meetups, uh, where we foster community with Chinese medicine practitioners and students from around the world. Uh, just want to say thank you for uh, joining us today. My name is Young, and I'm the co-organizer and host for this event. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our attendees. We hope that you have a great time at tonight's event, and we look forward to welcoming you to future ones. Uh, so before we get to our speaker of the night, um, I want to make a small announcement that we have officially moved away from using meetup.com's platform. And now we have uh, moved towards a Facebook group uh, known as Camo Meetups. Uh, so you could look for us over there. And if you don't have Facebook, uh, you can also follow us on our profile at eventbrite.com. Um, it's also called Camo Meetups. Uh, so be sure to follow either of those platforms or our social media pages uh, to get the latest updates on events like this one. So our mission uh, for this group is to facilitate connections between members and esteemed experts in our field. We greatly appreciate your input regarding potential speakers, so please don't hesitate to share your suggestions with us if any come to mind. Today marks our 148th event, and it's amazing that Camel has been hosting events such as this for the last 15 years. As a special thank you for attending today's event, each of you will receive uh, an email containing a $20 coupon for use at Camel's uh, practitioner online store, the uh, eSkirt Pro Shop. An email coupon will be forthcoming early next week, so if you don't see the email, please check your spam folder. The talk tonight is expected to last approximately uh, one and a half hours where Craig will lecture about for about 40 minutes or so and then we'll do some questions based on the remaining time. Uh, before we begin, I would like to share a few ground rules. Please mute your microphones to minimize background noise and to hold off on questions until our guest speaker prompts the Q&A session. If you have an urgent or relevant comment, please type in a chat box or raise your hand. And as your host, I'll do my best to address it and we'll let Craig know. So without further ado, uh, it fills me with great joy and pride to introduce our esteemed guest speaker, Craig Mitchell. Um, a little bit about him, he graduated from the American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine in 1993, and he has been involved in clinical mm -hmm. practice, teaching, and writing since that time. Craig published many translations, including On Cold Damage, Translation, and Commentaries. His work also includes translations of major works by renowned physicians such as Jiao Shude and Yu Guozhen. Uh, Craig is the president of the Seattle Institute of East Asian Medicine, where he teaches and also maintains a private practice. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Craig Mitchell as he shares his profound insights and experience with us today. Without further delay, I will turn it over to our esteemed speaker, Craig Mitchell. Thank you very much uh, for welcoming me. Nice book. Um, so, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm going rogue here. So I've, I've known Tom um, Leung for a long time. I was his teacher back a long, long time ago when he was a student at PCOM. And um, I, I am, um, I'm super interested. I don't know if it's possible for you guys to turn your videos on, but I would really like it if you would consider doing that if you don't currently. I understand if you're like in the bathtub or whatever and you don't want to do that. I get it. But um what what I'm you know, I, I'm uh I'm not gonna lecture. Um I'm gonna share some insights with you. Uh, what I'd really like to do is answer questions that you might have about the Shang Hanlun or its clinical application. I, I, you know, for um, I've been working with this text uh, since I was uh, 1992, however old I was then, um, and and to be honest, when I um, when I first started working with it back when I was in school, um, I found it completely incomprehensible. Uh, I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like working with it. I didn't understand it. Um, it was just, it seemed to me like it was this profoundly confusing, dusty book that just, I, it, it was, it didn't make any sense in, in light of anything that I had ever seen in clinical practice up until that point in time. 
And, and so I remember very clearly taking a class in the Shang Han Lun when I was in at ACTCM with a lovely uh, instructor, Li Fang Liang, um, who did her best to teach us, but it, it, it just didn't like, it did not click for me in any way. And I think for me and for most of my classmates, frankly, we kind of walked away from that class thinking, what in the world are we doing sitting in this room talking about like vomiting roundworms and weird symptoms that seem to have no relationship to anything that we ever really see in private practice and like what's the point and so it's sort of ironic that i would end up you know translating the text later in my uh trajectory and then spending the better part of the last 30 years working with the shang han lun and teaching it and talking to students and clinicians about it and um and then you know culminating recently in um working on a a translation of the shang han lun by dan bensky and ma shochun which i was a, i was the technical editor for that work um which is a fabulous book if you're not aware of that just it's not my book i mean i was just the editor but it's a great book if you're interested in the shang han lun so so i've you know i've ended up this has been most of my professional career has been working um at least touching on the Shang Han Lun in one way or the other. And it forms an important component of my practice, although it is by no means all of what I do. So, um, so what I wanted to do was actually to start by asking you all, um, just, I, I, I want to get a sense of who I'm talking to because other than, uh, than than one person who I know, um, most of you I don't think I know, um, so uh, or I don't know well in any case. So um, could I ask, like, is everybody here in active clinical practice prescribing Chinese herbal medicine? I see heads nodding. Yes, yes. Okay, no. I see one no. Um. Oh, still a student. Okay, cool. Um, so a couple of you are still students. Uh, student, student. Yes, prescribing. Okay, cool. Um, that's great. So um, the folks who are students, are you students at PCOM in New York? Yeah, okay. And um, okay, so that's that's cool. And for for those of you who are out there in clinical practice, um, let me just ask and feel free to unmute yourself if you want to reply or you can just reply in the chat, whatever, whatever you want. Um, but I'm just I, I, I want to understand, like, are there are there some of you who have been working with the Shang Han Lun for a long time? Is that why you're here? Because you're super interested in it and you've been working with it for 20 years yourself. Is there anybody in that category? No. Um, I think I just chased somebody out of the meeting. So for my questions. Um, so are, so for those of you who said no, are, are do do any of you who are in the meeting, right? Do you use the Shang Han Lun in your clinical practice? Yes, a little bit. Okay. Um, oh, I okay. Now I'm I'm seeing some folks who who I do know. Okay. Um hey there Spencer. Um not so much studying with Sharon. Oh, okay. So if you're studying with Sharon then you're certainly aware of the Shang Han Lun because I know Sharon uses it a fair amount, right? Okay. So it sounds like for the most part um folks here are maybe limited in in your exposure to the Shang Han Lun to date. So um so maybe one thing that we could do would be um let me just let me just give you a little bit of a of of a a quick little few minutes primer on the way that I think about the text and the way that I think it's uh one way anyway to engage with it. Um <clears throat> so uh 
so one of the first things to remember is that um, the the book that we know of as the Shang Han Lun was originally a larger text. Can you all see that whiteboard? Yeah. So the Shang Han Zabing Lun um, was the original name of the text. And this goes back to roughly Han Dynasty China. So, you know, roughly 200, give or take. Um, the part of the problem that we have when we look at a text like this is that what we know for sure is that at some point, the text was divided into two pieces. It was it was separated into one text that was called the Shang Han Lun, which which is what we all kind of know today, and then the other companion text is the Jing Gui, the Golden Cabinet. So originally these were one book, and they were separated by there, there there's disagreement, but probably they were separated by um well that's going to be annoying can i make that bigger there we go so they were um the text was probably divided by a fellow by the name of wang shuha um who uh, who made the decision to divide the text into the lines that specifically related to six channel theory so the Shang Han Lun side is where we get all this stuff about the six channels. And then the Jing Gui side is kind of everything else. So one way of thinking about that is that the Shang Han Lun part, this deals with externally contracted cold disease. So this means that all this means is that in the descriptions in the Shang Han Lun, the primary pathogen is cold. And it comes from the outside. For the Shang Han Lun, it comes from the outside and goes into the body. This does not tell you what, how the disease manifests once the pathogen gets on the inside. So when the pathogen goes in, sometimes it will remain cold. Sometimes it will get hot when it goes on the inside. So it is not in any way true to say that all diseases of the Shang Han Lun are cold diseases. They don't manifest as cold diseases. But it is true to say that the pathogen is considered to be an externally contracted cold pathogen that's the starting point now on the on the Jing Wei side on the other side this is diseases that come from the inside and go out so these are diseases that relate to more to lifestyle or diet psycho-emotional problems that kind of stuff right so more illnesses that are generated inside the body through not living in tune with the Tao, basically. Um, and, and having that then come out as some kind of disease manifestation. Okay. So, so we are tonight, for the brief amount of time that we have together, just talking about the Shang Han Lun side of things. I'm telling you about the background a little bit because I think it's important for you to understand what the structure of the text originally was and what we have coming out to us now. Now, one thing we said, I said that the Shang Han Lun, the Shang Han Zabing Lun was probably written around 200 CE, but we don't have a version of the text from 200 CE. What we have is something probably the earliest text is somewhere between 800 to 1000 CE. There, there's some disagreement about what the earliest version is and who has it. And, you know, it's one of those things. Um, 
someone's grandmother had it hidden in her attic kind of a thing. And, um, but what we know for sure is that in the Song Dynasty, which is right around this time period, we start to get what are considered to be legitimate versions of the text being codified by the Imperial uh, Physicians Bureau, basically. So just if you just stop and think about that for a second, it's an important, I think, orientation point because you have roughly 600 years or more between the text being completed and any version of it that we could put our hands on today. So when, I mean, with all due respect to any of my colleagues out in the community who might be teaching, if anybody tells you that they know 100% what the Shanghan Lun says about something, it's my opinion that you should be quite skeptical of what else they're trying to sell you. Because this text is, I mean, it's a fantastic text. And I obviously have spent a lot of my time, my professional life, devoted to studying it and trying to use it in clinic. But it's it's complicated. It's unclear sometimes. It's self-contradictory in certain places. It, and it is a product of its time. So, um, so it's not... You know, it's not a uh, it's not a technical manual. It's not a textbook. It wasn't written that way. And if you try and read it that way or engage with it that way, it will just be frustrating to you. So how should we engage with it? Well, in my opinion, you should think of it basically as a collection of case studies. So Ma Shochun is a physician here in Seattle, where I live. <clears throat> um, Dr. Ma is originally from Chongqing. He's been in the United States now for a long, long time. And he spent, oh gosh, I think roughly 20 to 30 years in China with a group of, of physicians studying the Shang Han Lun with a, with a main teacher and everything else. And now He's part of, you know, he he and Dan Bensky worked on this book together. And this idea of thinking about it as as case studies is something that originally came to me from Dr. Ma. I think what this idea helps us with is <clears throat> if you look at any of the lines from the text, you know, it will, it might say, um, you know, Tai Yang disease with, you know, maybe it says it's a floating pulse, headache, sweating. I don't know. Right. It just, it, it gives you typically a pulse, maybe some symptoms. Some of the lines might give you a little bit of an explanation about why the author thinks something is happening. Um, but very commonly, it doesn't give us um, all the information that we would typically need in a clinical setting. So what we end up having to do is we end up having to think through what what clues do we get what is the what how can we put the pieces together in the text in order to make something that's clinically usable and and so um there's a few ways if you're engaging with the text that you can go about doing that so one thing that you should understand right off the bat is for each of the six channels oops for each of the six channels 
there is a, the first line in each section of the six channels is a basic outline of that channel. So um, it gives you, like, for example, the Taiyang line, the first line of that section, um, it says that there's a floating pulse and it says that there is stiffness in the in the neck and headache. Um, it says that let's see, Taiyan Zhui Bing, Mai Fu Tou Xiang Chang Tang Wuhan, and it says that there's aversion to cold, chills. And so it gives you that set of signs and symptoms. And one of the things that you should remember is that those signs and symptoms will carry through anything in the text that has Taiyang Bing as a as its heading. So anything where it says there's a Taiyang disease, well, okay, then it has that symptomatology unless it tells you otherwise. In the Yang Ming section, it talks about there being excess throughout the Yang Ming system. That's a critical component of Yang Ming diseases. In the Xiaoyang section, it talks about this basic pathology associated with a pathogen constraining the Xiaoyang and what it does to the movement of the ministerial fire. So you can go through each of the six channels and you can, from that very first line in each of the sections, you can get an idea about the overall perspective on all of the lines that are associated with that channel system. And that can be a useful way to orient to the text. Other things that are important to remember, um, don't get hung up on trying to match the symptoms in the text with symptoms in your patients. What I mean by that is it's important to try and understand the pathomechanism. So if you understand the pathomechanism, then even if the symptoms don't match, but you still can have the same understanding of the pathomechanism, you can still use the same formula. So I'll give you one very concrete example of that. So in the Xiaoyang section of the text, one of the cardinal symptoms, one of the key symptoms that is described in the text for Xiaoyang conditions is what you all probably have heard of. It's alternating fever and chills. Right? That's a that's a key symptom for Xiaoyang patterns. So I'm curious, for those of you who are actually seeing patients in clinical practice, how many of you have ever seen a patient with alternating fever and chills? So I, I see a bunch of heads saying no, I haven't. Spencer, you have? Okay. I have, yes. I'm driving. Otherwise, I'd comment more. No worries. Don't crash. So I have two, but it's not very common. And one of the formulas, one of like the, the first formula really of the Xiaoyang section is Xiao Chai Hutong. So here's the conundrum for me when I first started studying this. I was like, I've been doing clinic for a while. I haven't seen any patients with alternating fever and chills, but I keep hearing people tell me how useful Xiao Chai Hutong is for all these different things. So I don't get it. Like if a patient doesn't have alternating fever and chills, then how am I going to know that 
that I should be using Xia Chayutong when one of the cardinal symptoms for that pattern never seems to occur in any of my patients. So one of the ways of thinking about that is, okay, this symptom that's described, alternating fever and chills, we have to think a little bit flexibly about it. How might it manifest in patients in our clinics, in our time frame, in our country, location, wherever we are, right? And so one of the things that I learned about this was actually for many of our patients, they don't report alternating. They don't really have true alternating fever and chills. What they do have is what I would describe as unstable body temperature. And what patients will say to you is, God, I, I can never get my clothing quite right, right? I go into my office. I, ha I brought a sweater that day because I was a little chilled when I left the house. I'm wearing the sweater. And a half hour after I get to work, I'm taking my sweater off because I'm so hot, right? Nobody else around me is having that issue, but I can't seem to regulate my temperature properly, right? That is a classic Xiaoyang symptom. Now, all by itself, it's insufficient to make the decision of using Xiao Chai Yutong, but it is a connection that you can make that says, oh, huh, let me check that out a little bit more and see if there might be other things present that would be consistent with a Xiaoyang pattern, right? So another one from the same, from the Xiaoyang section is this idea of bitter taste in the mouth. Okay. So again, very uncommon in the United States to hear patients describe having a bitter taste in the mouth. I have heard it. Maybe you have too, but it's not typical. Now, one of the interesting things that first started me thinking about this a little bit is I was in China. I was doing clinic there. And it seemed like every third patient said, I have a bitter taste in the mouth. And I, and I really, I had to step back and think about that for a second. I was like, I mean, are people in China really that different from people in the United States? Like at the end of the day, like every third patient seems like they have bitter taste in the mouth. I never hear patients in the U S say that. What, what's the deal, right? And what I've concluded over the years is that in the U S we have almost no association with bitter in our diets. Most people in the United States, not everybody, obviously, but a lot of people eat, <clears throat> a, a diet that has a very limited amount of bitter flavors in it. So people don't even really know what bitter tastes like. And I was teaching a class a while ago and one of the students said, well, what about coffee? You know, lots of people drink coffee. And, you know, I was in Starbucks the other day. Um, the only reason I was in Starbucks was because my wife had a gift certificate. It, I, otherwise, it would not have been in Starbucks. But, but like you go, if you hear what people are ordering in Starbucks, right? It's not bitter anymore, right? Because they've it's got whipped cream in it, and it's got caramel flavoring and sugar and a bunch of other stuff in it. By the end of the, by the end of the day, when they're finished with all of that, it's not bitter at all. So in any case. What, what I think people in the United States are more likely to tell you is that they have a, a, a bad taste in their mouth. It tastes wrong to them. They, they all say it, it, it tastes like it tastes gross or it just tastes off. And sometimes they will even describe it as metallic. And I think that all of these things, if you hear somebody say any of those things, it's a reasonable consideration that, that that may be bitter. And this is one of the ways that you can link what you're hearing from your patients in a modern clinical setting to what might have been said 
in the Han Dynasty or what, frankly, is still being, what's still said in China. So we could go through a lot of different examples from the text of what the text says and what we end up thinking that it probably, how somebody in modern clinical application would um, would actually say it in you know 2023 2024 in one of our clinics school clinic private practice clinic whatever okay so that kind of engagement with the text i think is required if you want to find the utility in the text and be able to make use of it yeah burn taste in the mouth joe yeah i i suspect that that is also this belongs to the same category yeah so, um, so I tell you, I mean, we just, we're, we seem to, I seem to have drifted into the Shaoyang. So since we're here, um, I want to just tell you one other quick little, little tidbit. Um, and any of you can try this. So I'm not going to try and teach you abdominal palpation in a Zoom meeting. That would be a fool's errand. However, because we're talking about Xiao Chai Hu Tong, I do want to mention one quick thing that you can easily try out and test on your patients wherever you're seeing them. So if if you imagine somebody's rib cage, so there's their torso, right? So this area underneath the rib cage. Oops. That I've shaded in. This is kind of the Shaoyang zone. And what you can do, very, you know, do it gently, but you can do this with your patients, is actually while they're lying on the table, um, preferably with a bolster underneath their knees, relaxed. You're going to ask them nicely, lift their shirt so that you can get to the lower area of their rib cage. And you're going to use the side of your hand, or you can use your fingertips, but you got to be really gentle if you use the fingertips. And you're going to just press in, trying to go underneath the ribs. For patients where Shao Chai Hu Tang, is a useful formula, generally speaking, you will feel resistance in this area of the torso. It's not typically uncomfortable for the patient, but it will typically feel like you try to put your hand in there and it's like, hmm, doesn't really want to go underneath the rib cage. It feels tight, full, increased density, right? Like there's there's something there that's stopping you from proceeding. So if you have a patient, uh, oh, Jessica, it can be, it could be um, either bilateral or unilateral. If it's, you know, like the true Shao Chai Hu Tang pattern is often bilateral. But, you know, I mean, you know that patients don't always, unfortunately, present in super clear ways. So my suggestion would be, if you feel it on either side, you might at least consider that as a formula. So, I, well, actually, while I have this picture of the abdomen, while I'm here, I'm going to I want to give you one other quick little um, clinical little little tidbit that you can play with. So while you're feeling that subcostal area underneath the ribs, take a minute and feel right here as well.
for some patients, this area will feel noticeably different than the surrounding tissue. It will often be, it'll have a feeling of an increased density. It will sometimes be slightly uncomfortable for the patient or will give them a feeling like they want to, like it makes them a little nauseous or even makes them feel like they want to belch. That is a strong connection with Banxia Xie Xin Tang. This is what's referred to in the Shanghan Lun as glomus or focal distension. So in my experience and in my current thinking, this symptom um, is virtually never reported by a patient. I mean, okay, maybe once in a blue moon, but generally speaking, patients don't have an awareness of this. It's not something that they feel until you press on it. Then they'll feel it and they'll be like, ooh, I don't really like that, right? But left to their own, they would not come in saying, gee, Wes, I have focal distension, right? There, this just isn't an area of the body that people are tuned into or have a feeling about typically. And so this was one of the things that, that convinced me of the importance of learning how to do some abdominal diagnosis in relationship to the Shang Han Lun. Um, since, you all, since you all are in, or you're not all in New York, I know, but many of you are in New York, you have um, maybe ready, or ready access to, um, to Nigel Dawes who teaches Kampo. Sorry, it's Japanese word, so there's no, it can be spelled either way. But, um, and this is a Japanese system of herbal medicine prescribing that relies heavily on abdominal diagnosis. So, you know, what I would recommend for those of you who are in clinical practice is you could even just play around with a couple things that I've told you about today tonight and see if you find some utility in them and if you feel like oh that was super helpful and i you know i used shao chayu tongue or i used bancha sheshin tongue when i might not have thought to use it otherwise and you want to explore it more then you can look for a course from nigel or um or me maybe um depending upon where you live uh but this can be super, super helpful for getting deeper into the Shanghan Lun and the formula applications. So I've been talking for a while. Um, do you all have any questions? Michael. Hey, um, I was talking with Michael he was at an earlier Cam Wall uh, meetup. Meet and I guess my question is like, Kampo feels to be really clinically uh, significant. And I wonder, because it does glean on the Shanghan Moon, and it's almost like a translation of that into more of our current times and usages, why would we choose to study the Shanghan Moon? Like, other philosophical or spiritual insights that maybe Kampo itself does not, um, maybe is lost in translation. Uh, so, so my understanding, I mean, how would I, how do I say this? Um, so Kampo, the earliest records of Kampo that I know about are from the 19th century, maybe late 18th century. So if you chose to just study Kampo, 
you'd be missing the first 1700 years of writing on the Shang Han Lun, which seems like an oversight. In other words, there's a lot that has been written and studied and talked about and clinical applications and usage and all this difference. I mean, from, from, um, throughout the Song dynasty, you know, Ming dynasty, like all these different writers and authors over the years. So I think that Campo is, I mean, I, I use Campo a lot in my practice. Um, but for me, Campo is, Campo is very, it's very empirical and it has almost no engagement with the idea of pathomechanism. Like it's, when you talk with people who, who really, really focus on Campo, they tend to think about um, the pattern that's represented by the abdomen and then that corresponds to a formula. And while I absolutely 100% think that there's a great deal of utility in the insights from Campo, I also think that there are lots of additional insights available through engaging with the, you know, more like, I guess, the traditional Chinese side of the, of the perspective on the text. I also think that, you know, as somebody who's, I've spent like the last, whatever, 30 years of my life studying Chinese. Um, and I think there's no substitute for going back to the source text, right? So if you're if you're if you're just looking at compo texts, then you're you're not going to be reading the Shang Han Lun itself. You're not going to go back to the source text because because that's not what those texts are about, right? So I I do think it's a it's a great it's a very useful piece of the puzzle, but to me it's not the whole puzzle. If that makes sense. Did I answer your question? Yeah, it raises more, but um, if other people have questions, <laughs> I'll, I'll hold off for now. Okay. So I'm interested to know if there are other questions. The most fun for me is to 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 uh, to answer questions. Let's see. Um, oh. Yeah, teaching tips on making ancient texts more interesting for students. Um, gosh, well, I mean, I think that, um, I think that anything that you can do, like I, I generally try to share, um, specific clinical insights that I've had. So, um, that might be, you know, talking about a case that I treated um, or or sometimes it might be, you know, talking about a mistake I made in clinic that helped me to learn something. Um, but I guess. I'm trying to think what I mean, I it, it's a little bit weird um, because in my school, in the program where I teach, uh, Shang Han Lun is is the first fundamental theory course that students have. So like first trimester, first course, fundamental theory is Shang Han Lun. So it's not hard to get them interested. Like they're, they're, you know, grappling with the whole, like, what is this? What's six channel theory? How does it work? How do like, and they're also, because in our program, they're in clinic right away working with senior clinicians, seeing patients. So they're, they're pretty quickly like, oh, we saw this patient and, you know, somebody gave Li Zhongwan and wow, like I just was reading about that in the Shang Han Lun and the patient kind of looked similar in these ways, but different in another way. And like, so they're, they're pretty engaged right away. Um, if you don't, you know, if you, 
if you don't have that ability, like if in your situation, with ever, whatever students you're working with, if you don't have the ability to do that, I think that what you have to do is you have to, or one of the things that's useful to do is to try and help people understand what, what does the text mean in terms of modern clinical practice, right? What, what, what does it mean? Why does the text talk about purging people all the time? And is that even relevant for us anymore? Right? So like you have to try and find some ways to to bring the language and the weirdness of the text into a modern context. And the purging thing um, is actually super interesting. We were just talking about this with some of my colleagues. Um, the Shang Han Lun has a bunch of lines that say, uh, you know, patient comes in, they have an externally contracted illness, physician purges them incorrectly or purges them at all. Purging is incorrect for an externally contracted illness. So whatever, um, it would always be incorrect. And so then the question was, well, w most people in modern clinical practice doing Chinese medicine at this point in history don't go around giving their patients purgatives willy-nilly. Like, I would imagine that for many of you who are practicing f even for a while, you may not have used a purgative at all or very rarely. And so then the question comes like, well, what's going on in the Han dynasty? Why were they purging everybody? Right. And then what, what does that mean for us? So leaving aside the question of what they were doing in the Han dynasty, but just thinking about like, how does that work in our patients? There are two main things that happen super commonly for our patients that are relevant to this, right? One is you have a patient who has an externally contracted illness. They end up with an upper respiratory infection. They go to see their primary care provider and they're prescribed antibiotics for a viral infection. Well, what does that lead to? It often leads to diarrhea. So you've essentially given a patient with an externally contracted illness a purgative. That wasn't, that's not the intention of antibiotics, but it often ends up with that result. That is, that is an example of purging an externally contracted illness. And you can use the insights from the Shang Han Lun to help you manage those kinds of cases. Another example is the use of vitamin C, right? Many patients that I've worked with over the years have the idea that when you get sick, when you get a common cold or a flu, you take vitamin C. How do you know when you've taken enough? You take it to, to bowel tolerance. That means you take it until it causes you to have a bowel movement or diarrhea. Well, there you go. You've now purged an externally contracted illness using vitamin C. So you can, if you can, if you can give students some of those kinds of examples to help them to understand the relevance to patients that we see, I think it makes the text more interesting, right? <clears throat> so those are just some ideas. Other other questions? Craig, I have one, please. Please. Um, and uh, thank you uh, for for tonight's uh, class and thank you to Camwell as well. So going back to when you started the editing project on Shang Han Lun, um, and, and I remember when you were working on that, by the way, but uh so um is there anything you know I, i'm sure that over time your perspective on things have evolved as as it is naturally the case for all of us but have there been any areas of the text where a completely new light shined on something or a completely different angle came to you that was 
very different from the earlier the earlier days that you had with the text? So, Joe, I feel like you've been in a class of mine before. I was on your clinic team at Pacific. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, wow, that's back in the day. Um, you know, I would say that... I would say that the 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 um one of the big areas that's changed for me is my understanding of Dreyen disease. Um I found Dreyen disease very I mean if the Shanghan Lun was confusing at a level of 8, you know, the Dreyen section was confusing at a level of 12. Like it it just was my it just it just never really came together for me very well and i didn't really know what to do with it except i mean the only thing that i really knew about was using wume wan for parasitic infestation um which you know is of limited utility frankly um but one of the things that i learned from dr ma is to is is viewing the the section on jue yin disease as a um Many of the many of the the patterns that are described in that text are essentially uh, patterns of liver spleen disharmony, and and so when you apply that logic to those patterns, um, it makes, for example, understanding how to use Wu Mei Wan uh, becomes. It, it it rounds that out in a in a in a way that makes it much more useful, right? So like I've used so I've used Wu Mei Wan, no not leaving parasites aside. I've used it for for patients where they have um, GI distress. They have diarrhea that might be urgent, and they have diarrhea that's often made worse when they're under emotional stress. Especially for those patients, if they have like redness, heat in the, re in the tongue or the face, that hot, cold separation that is talked about in the Dwayne Yin chapter, um, that combination of things, sometimes Wu Mei Wan is extremely helpful very quickly for that to get the diarrhea to stop and to harmonize the middle burner. So that's one, that's one area that I feel like changed very significant for me since, since the early days of working with the text. Um, another, another one maybe is the, um, there's a formula called Chai Hu Guajer Ganjiang Tong, often abbreviated as Chai Hu Gui Jiang Tong. Um, this formula is, I think, uh, at least for me, it was underutilized. Um, and again, it's it's a it's a formula for um, for Xiaoyang patterns when there is typically some uh, underlying spleen deficiency and maybe a little bit more dampness than you would expect otherwise. <clears throat> it could be damp heat, could be damp cold. You can, you can modify the formula a little bit based on that. Um, but I've, I've used that formula recently for a few instances of um, either actual gallstones or uh, or things related to sludge in the gallbladder where there's not an actual stone, but there's just sludge in there. Um, and so combining that formula with Sanjin Tang, which is um, Jin Qian Sao, Hai Jin Sha, and Jin Ai Jin, That's a really nice combination for working on gallbladder 
issues like that. So, I mean, the pattern still has to fit, right? So don't misunderstand. Um, but it's, it's something you can think about if you, uh, if you're working with somebody who might fit into that category. So, yeah, I mean, Joe, there's, there's probably a lot of things, honestly. Um, and, and, you know, honest, also I, I should say, because be, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say this before our time together is finished. Um, you know, I use when Bing formulas a lot too. Right. So one of the things that I've become much more comfortable with over the years is, is not just feeling like, you know, I need to use a Shang Han Lun formula for every patient. That's just, to me, that's foolish. Um, lots and lots of patients don't need Shang Han Lun formulas. They need something else. So keeping an open mind, um, I think is, is also, um, I've, I think I've become more open-minded as I've gotten older and, and more clinical experience under my belt. So, um, and, and while I'm thinking about things that I'm supposed to say before we leave, um, for any of you who are interested in the Shang Han Lun and learning more in January, we are doing a three day Shang Han Lun conference at our school in Seattle, which is the Seattle Institute of East Asian Medicine. And, <clears throat> um, you can, I know most of you are not, I don't know that any of you are on the West coast. Um, but if you're interested in participating, it is possible to do so via Zoom. And um, there is a, a registration form and, and all that good stuff on our, on our website, which is www.sieam.edu, Seattle Institute of East Asian Medicine, where I am the president. So um, that will be me, Dr. Ma, who I've mentioned, um, Dan Bensky will be lecturing. Uh, it's a rare opportunity, frankly, for to hear Dan because um, he doesn't lecture on this stuff very much anymore. Um, uh, Leo Guahue, who's a very, very experienced clinician, used to live in Portland, now lives in Seattle. Uh, and Greg Livingston and Daniel Altschuler, who are two of our faculty at our school, also very, very experienced practitioners. So it's a great opportunity if you're interested in this material. Other questions before we run out of time? Hi, can I ask a question? Of course. Hi, um, so I graduated last year and um, I've been practicing a little bit since then. Um, now the thing, the problem with having um, just graduated from, from acupuncture school after the pandemic was that we didn't really get too much um well we didn't really didn't get any um patients with external pathogenic factors in clinic because they weren't allowed to come right because we weren't seeing anybody um with any hint of a symptom um that might be contagious so um so so i guess um Maybe if you have any advice on that, and then also um, from like a very basic point of view. So like there's Shang Han Lun, there's Wen Bing, there's there's like wind cold, there's wind wind heat. Um, I kind of I, I know I really know the symptom that you know the the difference between wind heat and wind cold. But I'm wondering if if you have any kind of like tricks or like um, uh, like is there like one signifier where you would do like uh, a <laughs> mat wang tong versus more of like a yin chow kind of thing. Okay. So okay. gosh, um, how long do we have? <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, we have about like, I mean, it's 7.34 right now. So we were supposed to go till, till eight o'clock. So we do have oh, good. a little bit okay. of time. Okay, yeah. cool. So um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, first of all, first thing, is if you if you aren't uh oh okay here we go if you aren't already doing telehealth visits with patients i would strongly encourage you to figure out a way to do that um telehealth basically in march of 2020 we started doing telehealth visits with covid patients and we never stopped 
We're still doing telehealth visits with patients with externally contracted illnesses who we may or may not want to have come into our clinic. It is a great way to see patients who have externally contracted illnesses if you're at all concerned about getting sick yourself. So um, while it is not easy to see patients over telehealth, because obviously you don't feel the pulse, but you can do a lot of work over telehealth. And frankly, I was surprised at how much we were able to do that way. So I just put a plug in for that and for not being afraid to do that. If somebody is like, you know, classic, I had an appointment on Thursday, but I'm, you know, I have a fever and chills and I'm sweating and blah, 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 and I'm not coming in. Okay, fine. Let me send you a Zoom link or whatever system you want to use and we'll do a telehealth and then you can, you know, you got to have a, a way for them to get herbs that way. But I'm sure Camo could facilitate that. So, um, so there's a few different parameters that I think are critical and that often are overlooked when it comes to diagnosing externally contracted early stage, you know, wind, cold, wind, heat, what is it kind of a thing. Um, so let me, so let me see if I can go through these in a reasonably systematic fashion. So first thing is the issue of sweating. So it is, again, <clears throat> not unusual for patients to be unclear about whether they're sweating or not or whether they have sweat or not. Sometimes they'll know, sometimes they won't, sometimes they'll be confused, sometimes they're not thinking that clearly and they have a hard time telling you. So one of the things that you can do and what I would recommend that you do is you feel the palms. If the palm surface is moist, you can feel the forearm as well. If the palm surface is moist or the skin on the forearm is moist, then for your purposes, that's sufficient to know that there is some fluid passing through the pores. You cannot give that patient ma huang tong. That means you're either looking at, you know, gui zhi tong or yin chao san or something else, but you're definitely not using ma huang tong. Um, so, Second thing is, and this is a big one, people get very confused by this, by sore throat. And the problem is that you have no way of judging the severity of somebody else's sore throat by their words, right? So I've had patients who've come in and, you know, they say that they have a sore throat. They, they say it's really bad, but the rest of the symptoms don't really match up with that for me. So then I'm trying to understand, okay, well, what's going on there? It is absolutely essential that you take your phone or your pocket light, you have to look at their throat. So if the throat is red and swollen, you're welcome, Elizabeth. Have a good night. Um, if the throat is red and swollen, then generally speaking, you are safe to use a formula that clears heat, like in Shaosan, for example. If the patient is complaining about a very sore throat and you look at it and it's pale, not swollen at all, then you can't take their, I mean, you, it's not, it's, I'm not saying it's not sore to them. Of course it's sore to them and it hurts for them and that's true, but, but it, that, that should not then be a driver that pushes you to use a Wen Bing formula or Yin Chao San because the patient is reporting a sore throat. If it's not red and it's not swollen, don't use those formulas. 
So that one little piece of information right there will help you a lot from making mistakes with externally contracted illnesses. Um, other things to think about would be the tongue coat. So if we think about from what we know about fundamental theory, if a patient has an externally contracted illness and it's still really on the exterior of the body, generally speaking, the tongue shouldn't change very much. Like you might get a red tongue tip a little bit, you know, you might get a little something, but especially if it's a patient that you know, if you're seeing really radical changes in the tongue, you got to think twice about what's going on there. And particularly, I mention this because for COVID patients, it was very common to see them, still common, to see them with a very thick, greasy tongue coat even in the relatively early stages of the illness. And that's because there is a strong um, correlation between COVID and damp toxin, in my experience. So, you know, if you see it, if you have a COVID patient and they have that thick, greasy tongue coat, you can't use any of those formulas that we've talked about. No Ma Huang Tong, no Gui Zhi Tong, no Yin Chao San, right? None of those are going to be helpful for that patient. You're looking at switching gears into something that's more for damp, like warm, um, uh, damp warmth from the warm disease school. So then you're talking about things like San Ren Tong, or po po shaling tong. So those are those are some things I think that are kind of critical in terms of engaging with somebody with an externally contracted illness. Um, I guess the, the only other thing I would say is if you are seeing somebody in your office and you can actually take their pulse, understanding what a, um, what a true floating pulse is, is tricky. So, because not all people's pulses float the same way. So for some patients, especially those who have a, a little bit of a weaker system, their pulse may not really float fully to the full superficial level of the pulse. It's floating for them, but it may not feel like it's floating for you. So that can be a little bit tricky. Um, but what I would, you know, my general suggestion is always, you know, practice more, see as many patients as you can. Hopefully you have um, folks in your local community who you can reach out to when you have questions. Um, but, you know, there's just no substitute to just getting some, some reps under your belt. And, um, and also just remember that, you know, I've talked with a lot of physicians in China and Taiwan both, and I would say, for a lot of them, treating externally contracted illnesses is not easy. It's not a trivial task. Things move quickly. It's easy to be wrong. Um, you know, and the worst part of it is, like, somebody comes to you and they have a recent externally contracted illness, and you treat them, you do your best, you do acupuncture, you give them herbs, and they say, oh, yeah, I got better in about seven or eight days. Well probably you I mean you stayed out of the way you didn't make it worse right but many common colds get better in about seven or eight days even without any intervention so 
So don't don't be too hard on yourself if 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 that doesn't come easily at the beginning. It's not so easy to treat those kinds of illnesses uh, effectively and quickly. So other questions, comments? Yeah, hi. Hi, Craig. I, I um I have a couple of questions and, and just thank you. I've followed your work for a long time. I have your translation and cool. uh, know people who have trained under you and, and I, I greatly admire you. Thank you. I'm up in uh, just above you. I live uh, outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. So I practice. Oh, nice. Hospital. Yeah, I, I live on a small island just north of the San Juans and commute into my clinic on the mainland. Um, oh. And uh, uh, for the past 20 years, I've been doing uh, primarily dermatology. So I treat mostly skin disease, inflammatory skin disease. I trained in Hunan in the dermatology ward in 2005 and then trained under Mountain al Kafaji since 2007. Yeah. And I've kind of, you know, we, I'm close friends with him and practiced in his way since cool. then. And, you know, and that's kind of... Um, and and taken a deep interest in uh, I, I studied quite a lot of the Shang Han Lun in school before two thousand five. Um, my teacher uh, Dr. Yin uh, had his master's degree in Hunan um, in the Shang Han Lun, and so I was quite inspired by that. And but my question to you is: so you know I'm friends with Iran Evans who trained under Huang Hong and I <clears> chatted <throat> with him quite a lot. And you know about uh, Shang Han Lun. Um, application to skin disease and mm -hmm. you know and he'll always tell me Iran will say well you know Hong Hong sees thousands of patients but hardly not that many skin disease patients maybe children with eczema but uh, other than that they're, they're not very common for his practice anyway and he didn't really know of many people that actually uh you know that have a primary focus of skin disease with Shang An Lun, and and that'd be my question to you. Do you do you know? Do you see a lot of skin disease, or do you know people who who have a primary focus in Shang An Lun and skin disease? And I and I say that um, you know I know like I've watched Arno and how he practices, and and notice you know there's this part purity to the Shang An Lun, but then they'll be like, oh, but we incorporate Tu Fu Ling and Jin Yin Hua and these kind yeah. of things into practice. And so is that oh does that seem to be the case? Is there you know that that morphing or is that kind of why partly the Wen Bing was founded and and you know this kind of evolution from Shang Han Lun going in? Of course, I use Shang Han Lun principles in my practice all the time, especially uh, purging. I mean, I get a lot of inflammatory skin uh, people with inflammatory skin disease that have you know a hard to poop you know every five yep, days, yep. And so I'm giving them Da Ching Tong. But I'm doing that in conjunction with other things I know that are going to directly treat their psoriasis sure. or whatever else. Then, and so yeah, I don't know if you have much to say on that. I'm curious. I know. Uh, just one more point I'll make is yeah. uh, I know from uh, reading. I can't remember his name. He did. It was his PhD thesis was on. Um, it was on Shang An Lun in the Song Dynasty, and he presented this chart I found really handy. It was a table where it looked at. Um, different styles of training one would you'd go into internal medicine and of course you're going to study the jingwei um and then and shang han lun and then or you go into ex external disease and then you're going to study things like uh identification of sores and wounds and mm -hmm. all this kind of thing and back you know as far back as the song dynasty so i've always been interested in that kind of tra trajectory of you know do we is dermatology something seen as always something separate to get extra training in or are you good enough just learning the the concepts found in the shang han lun and, and the jingwei and go from there so this book that i'm holding up oh yeah which grant oh, yeah. which which granted is in chinese yeah sure sure but the entire book is about six channel theory as applied to dermatology Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. But in, only in Chinese, not uh, translated <laughs> yeah. yet. Yeah. Not translated okay, yet. Your next project, maybe. <laughs> well, I, so in answer, I mean, I see a fair amount of dermatology. Um, okay. Yeah. Not a huge amount. I, and not like Mazen or anything like that. I don't, I don't have sure. that kind of practice. I have um, my, my practices spread out um, because yeah. of the other requirements that I, of things that I'm involved with. But um yeah. i just treat i mean i it's just funny to me like in a way i guess what i would say is 
if you're good at using Mazin's approach to dermatology and you get reliable, consistent results using those formulas, then from a certain perspective, I kind of would say like, why, if it's not broken, why try and fix it? For, right, for right. me, for me, like I just saw a young woman who came to see me like a 13 year old whose mom brought her in. She has pretty severe acne on her back. And as a 13 year old um, young woman just starting to menstruate, she's of course concerned about not having acne on her back. Right. Oh yeah, of course. So, yeah. Yeah. So I ended up um, interestingly, like I ended up thinking about it as a Tai Yang disease and, um, and I ended up treating her with Guga and Huang Qin Huang Lian Tang. Okay. Um, uh -huh. Which, which has been, very very effective very oh, cool, quickly cool. for her mm. oh, so very cool so you know i like there's a number of different formulas i can think of from the shanghan lun or jingwei that i've used commonly so for for dermatology so that gugan huang qin huang lian tang is one um guajir tang chai hu guajir tang Guajir Ma Huang mm -hmm. Guban Tang, which is basically half and half Guajir Tang and Ma Huang Tang. Um, like there's a fairly good list of formulas that are used, I think, by people who are really uh, conversant in the Shanghan Lun. Those are the formulas that we often think of for dermatologic mm -hmm. problems. So I, I do think that they can be effective for dermatology. Um, hmm. Are they more effective? I mean, I think Mazin's pretty, pretty freaking effective from what I understand. Um, and oh, I've yeah, seen him, no, for sure. You know, so, yeah. so, so, yeah, can you? Sure. Um, uh, is it, is it a different entry point? Yeah. Um, is there utility there? I think so. You know, I think the mm -hmm. answer to all those questions is yes. Um, and certainly if you were interested in the Shanghan Lun and wanted to expand your dermatological practice in the direction of the Shanghan Lun, I think there's lots of room there. So yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, that answers a lot. I, I, I mean, I, my biggest question has always been is, was dermatology one of the reasons that, you know, where we would veer off from just using Shanghan Lun? Was it where people, doctors started to bump into a wall and go, I've tried everything. It's not, what do I need to do extra? And uh, versus, okay, well, what, is, what, what kind of uh, situations, patterns, you know, pathomechanism, um, you know, this is good enough. We can use, yeah. you know, the, this, these formulas that we have, but what are the times when, we may need to venture out. And, uh, and that's the kind of the, the journey of discovery for me. I mean, for the past 20 years really is trying to yeah. understand that better. And, um, but I like, uh, I like the things that you've been presenting. Maybe somebody will present some case studies at this conference. I'm thinking of coming down to this in, uh, in, uh, cool. in the new year. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of cases discussed. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Oh, very fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. Oh, that'd be great. Well, thank yeah. you very and much. This is, this has been good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Are there are there any um, maybe last questions before we call it a night? Okay. Well, I appreciate your uh, your attention and your questions, and uh, I I hope that maybe some of you consider uh, attending our conference. I think it'll be a lot of fun and super interesting. And um, and I hope you all uh, have, you know, have success using the Shanghan Lun and feel free to reach out if you have questions. I'm always happy to uh, to engage and answer any questions about the text or clinical applications. So um, thank you to Camwo for hosting this. Thank you, Hayoung, for your help. And uh, I guess maybe we'll just end there. Yeah, thank thank you so much, Craig. Um, I think just before before you go, um, I just wanted just to ask if you could just kind of share where people can find you. I don't know if you have like social if you're on social media or anything, but just like you know, even your practice or like any. I, mean, I know you already mentioned the uh, the Shanghai Run workshops that's going to go on in Seattle, but any other kind of fun uh, projects that you're uh, working on too, so that people can uh, you know follow you as we go. So I am I am the opposite of being on social media. Um, I I it's like um, 
I get hives even thinking about social media. So no, I don't do that. I have no presence. I do have a website, but it's 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 just a splash landing page. My email, I I I have put up there for anyone who wants it. Feel free. I'm happy if you reach out. I may not get back in touch with you for a couple of days, but but if you're patient with me, I'm happy to um <clears throat> to answer questions or engage with you about topics. The one thing I do want to um that I forgot that I should mention, uh, Dr. Huang, Huang Huang was mentioned and um, Aaron uh, and Daniel um, and I, uh, we are, there's gonna be a, a, new, a, a new translation of one of Huang Huang's handbooks coming out. I believe it will be like uh, in, in the store at Eastland Press uh, in January. So not in time for Christmas or the holiday season, but you know, uh, but just after. So yeah. So if you're interested in Huang Huang's work, um, it's a it's a very very like most of Huang Huang's things, very pragmatic, very clinically oriented, um, cases and um, lots of great information. So you can you can check that out if you're interested in that work also. Awesome. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, it's been it's been amazing. And I, I, I certainly definitely learned a lot, too, as I followed you along. So thank cool. you for sharing. <laughs> All right. Have a great night, everybody. All right. Have a good night. Yep. Thanks again, Craig. You're welcome. Thank you.